Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the Event Industry News Podcast with me, James Dixon, wishing you all a very good morning, afternoon or evening, whenever or wherever you tune into today's podcast from. Now, today's episode, um, it, it ties in a lot, actually, I suspect, with, with, with a lot of elements that I get up to in the event industry when I'm working out there as, as a freelancer. Um, we're going to be talking to somebody who works in film and content creation, um, and we'll meet our guests in just a few seconds' time. But, um, yeah, as we've all become used to over the last 18 months, two years, um, we've all effectively become TV producers in, in one respect, when we've delivered virtual events um, and as we've moved and merged out of the pandemic back to this new normal or hybrid events, it's very much going to be something that is going to stick with us, both uh, full virtual and hybrid in the coming years, and something we've spoken about a lot on the podcast in recent months. My guest today is a chap called Ben Hazeman and is a film and content creator for Sledge, and Ben joins us now from his studio. Ben, welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast. Hello, nice, nice to meet you and thank you for having me on. Not a problem at all, Ben. Um, and uh, as I said, you are a, a film and content creator. And what we're going to be talking about today, I suppose, is is, is going to be elements of that and how it merges into um, the events industry. Just to give us a bit of perspective, first of all, for people tuning in and listening to today's episode, um, give us a little bit of an overview about what your job entails, your own background, what it what it means to be a film and content creator. Yeah, so I work for Sledge. Um, for those of you not familiar with us, uh, we're based in London and we are a live experience and film production agency. Um, so yeah, it is all about bringing live events um, and film together, really. And that's, as you say, become more prevalent, I suppose, in the past two years with the rise of um, virtual events. And now as we kind of exit the pandemic phase, fingers crossed, um, the hybrid world um so that's kind of bringing that all together um my role at sledge is kind of looking after all of our film production uh side of things um and content creation and that's yeah everything from pre-production in terms of the day-to-day -day account management with clients through to the production and then post-production and delivery of, of the things that we're creating and and how much of that does tie into the the events industry? How much of it is 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 very much got its feet embedded in in the world of broadcasting, TV, and film, etc.? And mm. and how much your work historically was in events, and how much is in events now? So historically, it was more kind of standalone film pieces. Um, you know that may be you know a standalone events highlight film. So where Sledge would create or sorry, where Sledge would produce a live experience. Uh, myself and the film team would then, you know, create an events highlight film. And then we'd do some of the content for, you know, the, the LED screens and and um, the show itself. Um, we also then, of course, had our standalone film production pieces where we produced things for magazines and, and corporate clients and obviously still do. Um, but yeah, as we say, it has become more tied together and linked now where we're having to turn these virtual and, and hybrid events into a more EV like scenario. Sure. And, and, and I, I mean, people learned pretty quickly, didn't they? When the pandemic hit the, the value of good quality, well-presented right. content, you know, we, we, we all suffered whether or not it was on our family quiz or, you know, yeah. our, our group meeting with our, you know, team meetings with, with, with colleagues We've all been in those, you know, stereotypical initial Zoom rooms, you know, where everybody's just a tile on the screen. And pretty quickly, people did get used to maybe being a bit more or getting a bit more sophisticated, didn't they, with how they were presenting themselves, mm -hmm. graphics, video content, how to tie it all in. Um, how how quickly did, did you guys, I suppose, start to feel the effects of that in terms of people coming to you saying we're running these high, uh, virtual events to begin with? How do we make them look, sound, feel just that little bit more polished and that little bit more presented? Hmm. I think for us, at least, um, the whole kind of hybrid -y virtual piece was always a part of our work in that sense. So, hmm. But then that might have been more on an intranet and internal basis. So if we was doing a live experience or, you know, in-person event, it may have also been streamed to kind of a, a workplace or a, a local intranet for the rest of the, the client's company to watch. Um, mm. But I do kind of remember that in sort of February 
uh, I would in March 2020, um, mm. we had to very, very quickly turn an event for a publishing company um, into a virtual event very fast. So we kind of sprung into action with our sort of content creation knowledge and as best as we could turned it into a, a nice little um, virtual piece. So yeah, we was kind of quite reactive in that sense. Um, yeah. And I think we was lucky um, in that sense that we had that background knowledge in film and content um, and was able to deploy it quite quick. Um, kind of, I suppose, those that may not have had their kind of film side internal internally in their companies might have had to have then, you know, been a bit more um, reactive in that sense, I suppose. Yeah. Proactive, uh, I guess. Uh, and we, I mean, as event organizers, regardless of whether you do it once a year or, you know, several times a year with, with an agency, who, who knows, but, you know, very quickly we had to sort of change our skill set and, and, and change yeah. completely what, how we were thinking. And, and as I said at the beginning, you know, uh, overnight, a lot of people effectively became, you know, broadcast producers, TV producers That's instead brilliant. of event producers. And, and, and I learned very quickly, it does put a completely different slant on everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm um yeah, you you, you really. do look at things differently don't they did you find yourself actually suddenly giving advice out for, for for people where maybe you hadn't been asked for that advice before but suddenly because of the line of work in the area that you work in in your expertise mm. you then need to convey some of that to the to the event clients yeah definitely and that could be you know anything from the content itself uh, you know like what is the story we're trying to tell mm. even through to the more the look and feel of it in terms of you know people are sat at home and they all by default you know put their laptop if you're a presenter by default put their laptop on their table and then you'll be looking at their ceiling so it's you know, <laughs> yeah. even little things like that little nuances where you have to kind of take a moment with yeah there it's we that, go it's, <laughs> it's that one it's that one hello yeah. uh, for anybody watching the video you, or, or head over to eventisyournews.com and yeah. watch the video yes this is the view we all saw for the first few months of the pandemic That's the default pandemic view um <laughs> But that's so true. Like it was such a, you know, back to basics experience where we then had to explain to, you know, people that weren't in any form of creative industry and they're from, you know, quite corporate industries that have never had to think about how do I frame a shot? You then have to kind of guide them. OK, we want you to sit like this with your camera pointed at your eye line, consider their lighting, sound quality. Um, and that's kind of hard as well, because, you um, you know, I think as we were kind of saying before this, um, a lot of corporate companies and clients are kind of giving you a standard issue laptop that it was never built for any form of multimedia production. Sure. Or, yeah. yeah. You know, you can't expect everyone to be on, you know, a top spec MacBook or whatever. Um, so, yeah, you kind of have to get the best of, of out of it as best you can, really. Um, thank, thank god for amazon i bet they, they did a roaring trade in usb mics yeah. in march and april 2020 <laughs> didn't they ring um, lots. That, and, that was a popular one wasn't it yeah yeah <laughs> every, every everyone buying them um yeah. I, I mean i i am always amazed at what you can do even with a basic laptop mm. nowadays you know that there are all sorts of things that you can do just simple things and we, we, yeah. i mean we spoke about it but you know back at the height of the pandemic about you know just just simple things and mm. And the one thing that I did chuckle at is if you've ever, if, if anybody listening to this today has ever sort of been part of a corporate video, mm. if you've ever been on the, on the team that's producing a corporate video, trying to get a CEO or an MD of, you know, just a, a normal quote unquote business to stand mm -hmm. in front of camera and behave like Ant and Deck, it yeah. could be like pulling teeth sometimes. And suddenly yeah. all of these guys effectively would, would had to do exactly that overnight. They had to yeah. go on screen, learn how to, talk down a lens yeah. learn how to engage an audience down a, a camera yeah absolutely i think we, we actually had um a similar experience um on a, on a previous job um where we had the exact same discussion and and the client was saying i can't believe like how they do it on tv you know if you take you know your your ant and deck example they've got an earpiece in their ear with a director and a gallery shouting at them with a countdown clock you know they've got to remember their script and read off the auto cue the camera you know obviously that's on a much larger scale it's, it's huge those sort of shows but if you kind of drill it down to the making you know virtual events more tv like they do have to kind of i guess embrace that role a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah and um again i suppose when you're working on on 
you know, content creation, you know, that goes right back to the pre-production elements, you know, the, 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 the script, the introductions, things like that. And again, this is something that we've all had to become a bit more au fait with, isn't it, in the last two years? You know, if it is a professional event and you may have several thousand people tuning into this virtual event, even mm. if it is on a simple platform like a Zoom or something more sophisticated like a vMix, mm. you know, you actually want a professional introduction, don't you? You yeah. want somebody to come on screen after some opening credits and actually deliver something that's coherent, that's succinct, that links mm. nicely to the next bit of content, you know, and... Again, this is stuff that maybe as, as event producers, we've never quite had to work with our presenters as hard as we had to when we're delivering content on a screen. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, if you took a in-person experience where, you know, you're doing something for the whole day, um, you know, you've got your whole corporate team together and, and they're in a venue and they've got, you know, they're moving around and all the rest of it. But I think with the virtual thing, you're kind of, condensing it aren't you normally into you know like a one hour show really because you know for lack of a better phrase the whole zoom fatigue thing is real i think people are kind of not bored but you know they're they're very used to the whole sitting and in front of the screen and watching a tile talk at them (laughs) yeah there is definitely that um you know needing to make a one hour event very tv like in that sense and 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 an entertainment piece i suppose um you know you want to communicate your your information um or your topic that the Mm. event is about but i think yeah um making it entertaining is 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 the key thing so i guess people will associate looking at a screen um with that you know watching a show kind of element won't they yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose it, it brings us nicely and links us nicely to, to maybe exploring or asking you about trends. I mean, it's it's always a bit of a, a I feel sometimes a bit of a cliche to ask, you know, what, what people think, what what are your predictions? What are, what are the trends that you're seeing at the moment? But when it comes to um, duration of content, I think that that's perhaps a key one yeah. to start on. And when you talk about taking some of those TV and video production elements into what we're doing on a virtual or a hybrid event um, mm-hmm. with people watching at home, shorter content seems to be something that most people have identified as, as something that they need to to work towards. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you you know if you look kind of outside of the uh, the sort of virtual sphere and TV sphere, you know, you look at stuff like TikTok or Instagram Reels, and that's probably people's main, you know, content that they consume on a daily basis. And they're, you know, 60 seconds or less, or I think TikTok now you can do three minutes or less, but very, very short, snappy bits where people will just scroll, scroll, scroll. So, yeah, people are getting um, kind of not conditioned, but they're getting more used to short form content and if you lump a 60 minute presentation at them and expect them to sit through that they might get a little bit bored but um but yeah people are definitely more used to snappy short punchy content these days hmm. uh, uh, on that subject uh, mm. uh, moving it on a little bit how aware are you or your clients when it comes to the fact that people who are not sitting in the room with you Mm-hmm. And, I, and sat at the other end of advice it's much easier for them to just switch off and disappear and i've said this on previous episodes you know if you're in a room an actual conference room in a hotel with a guy talking mm-hmm. on stage very few people are just going to get up and decide that they've had enough of this and walk out but yeah. it's so easy to do when you're at home yeah definitely i know what you mean about that i think there's then that element of crafting the content um to kind of fit like we're doing now in a podcast sense i think so people can still go about their day as such, be sat at their desk, but they can put it on in an, in an audio format and, and be listening to it in the background and still kind of um, engaging. But then if you have those call to actions throughout, such as, you know, a poll or some sort of gamification or, or a live Q&A, you can kind of bring people back into the zone. But I think, yeah, having that balance where if it is quite an information heavy topic that mm. you're trying to communicate, you know, think about, what the narrative is and and that kind of thread you know can it be an audio only piece where they can still listen to it and you know crack on with their work whilst they're whilst they're listening yeah i I was gonna i was gonna ask you actually about a a, a term that i've read the immersive listening you know and whether or not that's something that is that maybe what you're alluding to there is is is, you know maybe thinking about content that can 
be delivered once but serve two purposes if that makes sense so again in this instance we record video and audio with our podcast you know the video goes up onto the event issue news website but people can then go onto their podcast platform just listen to it in audio and ideally they should be able to get exactly the same derive the same amount of of takeaway yeah whether they choose to watch it or listen to it Mm. no definitely i think you're yeah you're spot on there i think having been able to you know reuse your content as well across all sorts of different you know platforms and, and methods so you know audio video social cut downs you know ways that people can consume the content not just you know in that one hour broadcast but you know you're having it kind of spread itself across a wider narrative i suppose or, or communication objective mm. and i suppose when, the term content as well is is fairly broad when mm. when, when you think about it you now when i introduced you a film and content creator but yeah. I mean, content can be an infographic now, couldn't it? Put yeah. up on, on on social media. It doesn't necessarily have to be video. It can be something that is static. But I suppose again, that that ties in with with some of these shorter messages that people mm-hmm. wanted to get out. Yeah, definitely. I think that again, it comes back to that thing of the the th- the thread. I suppose like the mm-hmm. the events thread and its concept. So you know, you are filming a piece. Um, let's say you're you're in a scenario where you've got your speakers on on a on a stage or like a studio stage. I, I mean, where you've mm. got a couple of cameras and or you know you've got a panel with some people sat off to the side. You've then got to think about you know your your lower thirds that come up and your yeah. graphics behind them and things like that. So yeah, in terms of the overall look and feel, people like it to be you know on brand and have that recognizable look and feel. So if you're working with a specific company. You know, you'll create things that are very reminiscent to their brand or, or the event's identity, I suppose. Yeah. Well, when you're when you're working on creating film, particularly for clients, mm-hmm. um, and you are using more sophisticated stage setup, something that's more mm-hmm. akin to a you know a BBC News studio or a live TV studio that we'd see on telly. Again, people have got very used to seeing this shot. You know that, that we've got now, which is the you know the the head and the shoulders, the bust, effectively just on camera yeah. in a in a tile. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how conscious do you have to be that people may be accessing business related content? So if it's, if it's an event, for example, on mm. a laptop or an iPad or something like that, where it's a smaller screen, they might not be watching mm. on their telly at home. How, mm. how careful are you when you're creating the sort of film and uh, film content using proper studio facilities? Mm. I think in, in that sense, you keep it kind of familiar, like you said, because people will recognize, you know, a, a single shot or a two shot or a wide shot of a panel. You know, you're not going to do, um, you know, Michael Bay and Transformers. Um, <laughs> for, for, for a back value. Um, but, um, but yeah, keeping it familiar, keeping it nice and clean. But I think when you're in that studio environment or location environment, you've got that element of depth to it. So whilst people are used to this kind of tile um shot that we're on now i think yeah when you've got that bit of depth people then associate it with the the tv style in that sense Hmm. as as a as a creative person and somebody who's you know presumably people knock on your door or or email you and pick up the phone daily to to, Hmm. to get ideas from you they want you know creative inspiration um Hmm. have the last two years presented you actually with more creative inspiration than you've ever had because of the situation I think so. Um, or at least if it's not creative inspiration, it, it's definitely thinking either outside the box or having to really kind of stretch your imagination in terms of the tools that you've got. Mm. Um, so, you know, you may be limited to filming in, you know, a, a corporate office um, in the city and, you know, there's not a lot of, um, what's the word, excitement, I suppose, yeah, yeah. from like you know a plain office backdrop but yeah there's ways of you know dressing the room i suppose and planning those little shots that you can do in a in a sort of multicam scenario just to make it that little bit more engaging but yeah definitely in answer to your question it's it's made made us think a lot more <laughs> yeah and, and you're right I, I mean i've got my own experiences of that you know just to to sort of throw them out there if anybody's mm-hmm. interested and 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 it harks back to some podcasts that we've uh, recorded just before Christmas, sort of late November time, I think it was, uh, down at the Business Design Centre. 
Uh, oh, no. And it was for the AV. They were having the Association of Event Venues. Um, and thanks again to those guys. We had a great day down there recording some podcasts. But mm. we set it up almost sort of radio studio like. You know, yeah. I, I took, you know, some desktop mics and mm. set them up. And I had my laptop there. And it was effectively exactly the same setup that I've got here right now to record this. But instead of using the camera in my laptop, I plugged in a, a webcam instead mm -hmm. on a tripod so it yeah. gave us a, a wider shot yeah. and you could see everybody that's cool but we were lucky that in the background they were building an event in their big hall there they really had this nice big glass window and the door was actually fully branded with the business mm. design center logo so as soon as i walked in that room just armed with a suitcase and a backpack yeah. with a few bits i thought well great there's my background there's yeah that's, that's my studio you know i've not had to bring anything with me but it, it was there yeah. You know, it, it, it was just so obvious to use it because it gave us stuff mm. happening in the background of the shot that was relevant to the conversations we we're having and a bit of branding. I think that in most scenarios now, most going back to what you were saying about filming in a corporate office, mm. there will be things that people can use. Maybe a TV on the wall that you can mm. throw a logo up onto just to yeah. put something in the background. There's all sorts of little things that people can do. I think, yeah, and, and I think just something you touched on there a second ago about, you know, what is it all about? I think we was doing work in in the summer for cop 26 um right. and some sort of sub dialogues to cop 26 and it was all about nature and forests and and all the rest of it so it was summer so we thought well there's no point filming in a studio because that's just going to look like a studio so we took it outside and filmed in in kew gardens in just outside wow. west london, isn't it in, in west london yeah yeah um, so yeah it's, again that thing of you know thinking a bit what can we do not necessarily different but you know it relates to the topic and you know it gets us outside and it kind of you know all crosses over nicely so yeah that was that was a, an interesting one because an outdoor shoot is a totally different ball game to an indoor shoot <laughs> yeah, 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 def um, yeah. I, I worked um something i wanted to to, to ask you about today was, was sort of more, more hardware related I, I worked with a company um at the back end of last year on a live event who used um iphones Mm. to do the actual um live camera stuff that was happening mm. it was being live streamed as well out of the uh, out of the venue mm. but we were also taking that feed and using it to put up onto the big screens that were in the venue as the sort of the imag stuff and 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 you know mm -hmm. shots of winners walking from their tables up and it was all done using iPhones yeah. linked to an iPad wow. um so there were no shoulder mounted cameras anymore and stuff mm. like and I have to say it was brilliant it's the first time I'd worked with that that particular hardware setup and uh, uh, what i wanted to ask is you know with with how much more sophisticated our device day-to-day -day devices are becoming in terms mm. of what they can do the quality of the film that you can shoot on a yeah. on a smartphone now even down to how fast the processors are on there in terms of editing them and doing some stuff there does that does that also shape what you guys are doing at a pro end of things yeah absolutely i think that I think that's a whole separate podcast, actually. That's a, that's a good idea. But yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. I think technology itself is getting bigger, but the devices are getting smaller. So, mm. you know, you've got um, DSLR cameras, um, obviously slightly bigger than an iPhone, um, but DSLR cameras now that, are sh that can shoot, you know, very, very, very high resolution in very, very good codecs as well. So you've got amazing quality. Um, from DSLR cameras, but even on on the iPhones, they can shoot in the um, in in the I believe now they can shoot in the ProRes codec, which is a very good very good codec. Um, and yeah, it's it's yeah, it's amazing to see how this technology is kind of progressing. You don't need a huge rig now to get those cinematic results. Mm -hmm. However, there is still that kind of I suppose it's called kind of like the client element of if you turn up with a small camera to an office to do a corporate <laughs> yeah. thing. Where's, where's the big camera? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is that smoke and mirrors aspect, yeah. I suppose, still that if people are paying mm -hmm. you know, good money out for professionals, yeah. they, they do expect them to come in with the full mm -hmm. rig, don't they? The it's TV studio, the big tripods and everything. Well, yeah, the thing is, though, now you don't need that. Um, you've got, you know, very, very able small cameras, you know, the, the Blackmagic pocket cameras, they shoot. It's not all about resolution, but, you know, they can shoot. 6k um now and, and yeah incredible resolutions um it's yeah, yeah it's an, it's amazing how it, how the technology's kind of progressed in that sense that the form factor's got so much smaller but the the punch that they pack is ever increasingly harder it's it's interesting yeah that you 
you flagged something there that I don't think we've we've quite twigged on yet mm. uh, when we've been talking about this in, in other episodes of the podcast mm. is 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 that perception that sort of smoke and mirrors mm. you know that because stuff is getting smaller and you can you can get the same quality now out of a phone in your pocket as you could have done out of the best quality yeah. you know uh, camcorder twenty five years ago you know by That's some di- by some distance um, and and so. But there is still that element that when people are paying, certainly for, for professionals to come in and do deliver content on their behalf, that there is an expectation that comes with that, mm. um, that, that, that they don't necessarily understand. No, you're absolutely right. I think at the end of the day, you know, your your gear can do an incredible amount and you're paying for the expertise of the, you know, the crew and, and the editor in the post-production, et cetera. Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of a perception as well in, in, in a virtual sense as well. I think some clients perceive virtual as being a, you know, a, a cheaper or easier option, but mm. that's far from the truth, um, <laughs> to, to be honest. Great, uh, great, great point. You know, great point to say that, you know, to, oh, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's just mm-hmm. cheap and we don't want it to, you know, but, it, it costs a lot to put on a good TV production. Yeah. You know, you look at if you look at the list of the credits at the end of a TV yeah. show, see how many people are involved in putting on that half an hour live TV show. Absolutely. You know, it's far more than just a cameraman and a director uh, and yeah. a guy on camera. You know, that there's a lot of people involved, and and you're right to to flag up that they see it as a. Some people can still see it as a cheap alternative, yeah. but actually if you take the opposite approach and put the same budget in as you would put into yep. a live event, you can deliver spectacular results. Absolutely. I think, you know, there are trade-offs um, on the budget, but they're not necessarily, you know, it's just going into another pot, isn't it? So, mm-hmm. you know, in your live experience, you might, or in person, you know, you'll have your, your venue costs, etc. but your venue is a studio or it's your um, technical sort of gallery and backline that you're having to pay for the crew that, that are there. Um, so yeah, it's it's not necessarily cheaper. It can be easier, of course. Um, but yeah, it's it's all going in different pots, really, isn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah, it, it is definitely. Um, so something uh, it, it was it was on the lips of everybody, and it kind of got parked a little bit because of the pandemic. Is mm-hmm. a sustainability um, yeah. uh, topic, and mm-hmm. it was huge in the events industry and in most industries, in fairness, um, pre-pandemic, and understandably just as it was i felt reaching a bit of a crescendo in terms of noise and people really taking um uh, hold of the whole sustainability topic and doing something meaningful about it it seems to have just been parked a little bit but is now creeping back in yeah. um where does it tie in, in the world of sort of film and content creation in in your industry in your industry and into the events industry um the, the idea of sustainability how is that working from 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 your end of things i think you know if you if we're producing something for, you know, a global company that is based across, you know, from San Francisco to Hong Kong, you know, we did one for a a company, um, those people would have had to have come together and, you know, that would have been a lot of, a lot of air miles and, and big big carbon footprint on that sense. So if we can condense that into, you know, what do you want to communicate? What do you want to achieve? And put that into a show, you know. I think that's you're going to be taking, you know, tons of carbon dioxide out of the air just by getting people online and doing it virtually. Um, mm. And if we can create a good show that communicates the same message, and you don't have to have 500 people flying across the world to to one location for, you know, what is really a, a couple of hours or, or a few hours, then I think we can have a big impact in that sense. Definitely, yeah, and 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 I mean, re- reflect on it all. It, it, it certainly for me that the last two years have been the biggest kick up the ass for for the events industry, and yeah. from a content point of view, than they've ever had before. You know, mm-hmm. people were, whether they like to admit it or not, very complacent, set in their ways about doing things. Mm-hmm. You know, the most uh, at the sort of the, the what I call the ground level of it. You know, mm-hmm. your day to day hotel conferences, the mm-hmm. mundane. 100 people sat in right. rows of chairs with a projector and a PowerPoint presentation yeah. at the front. You know, presentation, mid-morning coffee, presentation, lunch and networking, <laughs> presentation, afternoon coffee, presentation, final speech from director, mm-hmm. everyone go home. 
it was the most mundane thing that people went through and 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 people have had to shake up what they're doing yeah. completely and i think it's been such a great kick up the backside for you mm -hmm. know for guys like you for content creators for event organizers to actually be able to sort of kick their clients a little bit and say come on you really got to think about what you you're putting yeah. out here no absolutely i think although you know i i enjoy my filmy side and content creation side i think in person is always going to be better in a networking sense and a human sense because people like being together. I think mm. you know having people together in a room is is so much better than a, than a chat bar at the side of a screen. Um, so I think when you kind of bring those two together, you know, I think the the content creation side of things and the expectation that things should in quotation marks <laughs> um, should be more TV like or entertaining. I think that's now. Uh, uh, an expectation now in that sense that people don't want to just have death by PowerPoint in a room. So, but I think, yeah, people being in the room together is so important and, and much more enjoyable. I mean, especially after the last two years, but yeah, I think it's just people want the content elevated. Um, so mm. especially in that kind of hybrid sense, I suppose, and, and in that in-person sense, that's, that's an mm. important thing. Well, when you're actually, piecing together content and you're, you're filming something for mm. a client one thing i've noticed particularly on the news that you just turn mm. on a channel a news channel at any time of the day and you'll see this is that um because everybody has got used to talking into a phone or a, a tablet or a laptop mm. now uh, and 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 having you know T especially at tv they can patch in people's zoom or facetime feed yeah. straight onto screen um it means that we can talk to people and see them in scenarios where we couldn't have done before. Yeah. You know, you take the news at the moment, you know, um, before they might have a guy on the line and it would have been just on a telephone yeah. with his audio. Now they can cut to the, you yeah. know, the, the, the surgeon sat in his office at home and talk yeah. to him on screen. D is that reflected right down into sort of some of the filming that you guys do where somebody might not be able to make it and you can bring them in remotely and make it part of the shot? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think people have, you know, thought of, of that as an essential now you know if you're doing something on location or in a in a studio with an led wall people immediately think of that new sort of set scenario where you'd you know have a pip on the led wall and have someone you know live because people have seen that they can can do that now whereas before they might not have considered it mm. um but yeah again it, it's that whole convenience thing as well i suppose of people being in you know, lots of different locations around the country or even around the world that everyone can kind of come together at one time and have that discussion or bring them in live so they can contribute if if they're not able to make it in person um but yeah you're absolutely right it's, it's definitely um kind of had a change in that aspect hasn't it yeah i i i think it has personally you know pe people now can oh that they can't join us oh hold on we could just throw them up on screen here yeah. you know if they can join can you make it from home yeah great dial in on your laptop and we'll throw... even this even though it's simple of of conferences going back to my and i'm not being disparaging about it going back to my <laughs> classic mundane hotel conference most 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 av techs now would would have no problem at all patching mm -hmm. the audio through into a simple mixer yeah. and putting somebody up on screen you know even if they've got the most basic sort of four input vision mixer you know yeah. you could pip somebody's you know yeah. zoom screen up onto onto there and make it work and i think that comes back to to your point earlier about you know iphone cameras versus big cameras that i think has also i'm not an expert in in this side as such but you know you can get vision mix uh vision mixers by black magic the atem ones that are tiny they're like the size of a keyboard and relatively cheap yeah um, relatively cheap um Audit, well, they're still professional level, but you know, compared to what we're used to, relatively cheap audio in, interfaces, etc. Yeah, so, yeah, you can definitely bring people in easier and faster as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's good. <laughs> a, a whole, a whole other topic, like you said early. You know, the, 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 the hardware side of things fascinates me. You know, yeah. how, how you know, I was watching these guys a, a couple, a couple of months ago, do, yeah. doing, you know, five you know cameras in operation all on gimbals and and it all just feeding back to an ipad they're doing all their yeah. process and stuff uh, you know all of that stuff does fascinate yeah. me how we can we can deliver really good quality stuff now yeah with stuff that most of us just take for granted and we yeah. just throw in our bags you know day to day and use it to send emails i think yeah the kind of prosumer level stuff is is definitely you know an, an incredible sort of 
product sphere, let's call it. Mm. For you know, as you say, people would think you could just throw it in, in your bag, but you've definitely got a, a, a bit of a Swiss Army knife in, in there in terms of its professional qualities as well. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. And we, we've been talking on the podcast today to Ben Hazeman, he's a film and content creator over at Sledge. Um, and I feel like we've probably opened about five different cans of, of worms here today. And, and um, we should definitely get you back on, Ben. You're your sure. first first time guest on the podcast. But I, I feel like we've sort of just scratched the surface today. And um, yeah, maybe we should get you on as our regular sort of uh, film and content uh, correspondent. Why not? I'd be up for that. Yeah. Yeah. If we need anything film or content related now, that's it. Tweet at event news blog and we'll get Ben back on to um, to answer any of your film and content creation questions. And uh, generally joking aside, I'm sure people have got them. You know, if you want to get in touch, guys, um, do it. You know, fire some questions over to at event news blog um, for the podcast and um, we'll get ben, ben back on and, and, and talk about some other stuff. Before we do wrap, Ben, um, mm. if, if people want to find out what, what you guys are up to at Sledge, um, how, how do they find you? How do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so um, obviously Sledge website, sledge.co.uk and, and we're on Instagram and all the other social media channels at Sledge Live Event um, or you can email us hello at sledge.co.uk. Fantastic. Yeah, brilliant guy, uh, Ben. Um, th- thanks for sort of taking, you know, a bit, bit of a moment out of your day to sort of have this almost sort of scattergun approach no, uh, I, I, conversation I to open things up. Right, start on a topic and just, yeah. See where, it, see, where it go, see where it goes. See where it goes. I suppose on that scattergun topic, um, if you want to find out more about what's going on with Event Industry News outside of this here podcast, then go over to eventindustrynews.com. You can check out the latest news, features and supplements and everything that's going on in Event Industry News. Um, of course, if you're already on the website and you're watching the video of this, don't forget that you can listen to audio-only versions of all of our podcasts. Just go to wherever you get your podcasts from and you will find the Event Industry News podcast and as i said on twitter at event news blog if you want to tweet us and get any questions or topics or you know guests that you think might make great guests on the podcast then get in touch with us that way um it's been great speaking to our guest ben Hays- uh, ben hazeman today um ben we'll see you again on another uh, uh another podcast hopefully with loads of questions from all of our viewers but for now we bring us to the end of today's podcast uh my name's james dixon it's been great as always and we'll see you on the next edition cheers guys Thank you.